on my drive back and forth to church and home and pick up kids, one of my favorite entertainments is Dan Lebetard's sports radio show out of Miami. One of the regular guys on the show has been with him for a long time, and he's kind of the court gesture of the show. He's the guy that you're friends with, you know you've watched the game with, but you definitely wouldn't trust him for much. He's the friend you wouldn't loan money to. Stu is an expert at contradicting himself, even in the same sentence. My, one of my favorites, trust me, I'm the least trustworthy person you will ever meet. Here's another favorite, I'm sorry, but I'm just not gonna apologize. Did you catch that? One of my first introductions to cognitive dissonance, Stu's expertise, cognitive dissonance, was in college in a theater class looking at classic literature and how classic playwrights used cognitive dissonance to create a tension that we had to unravel, we had to work through. It didn't take long for me to understand that concept because I've been living it my whole life in one way or another. And you probably have too. Now let's make sure we're all using the words the same way. Cognitive is our understanding, right? Dissonance or a discord, a disruption to that. So it's something we believe or idea we hold that is inconsistent with something else we believe or something we do. So we know smoking causes cancer, but many people still smoke. We know that wearing a seatbelt is the safest thing, but some people don't wear their seatbelt. It's a cognitive dissonance, a cognitive dissonance. It's believing that the world will end soon and then going to the lawyer to have your will made out. It's thinking that God is a God of love that likes to send people to hell. Cognitive dissonance. John starts out in chapter 3, where we're reading today, with a really fascinating conversation. One of the Pharisees has come to him in the middle of the night. Nicodemus is one of the leaders that Jesus is often pushing back against. And Nicodemus doesn't speak to Jesus in the flow of everyone else. He comes at night. And they have a conversation about metaphorical realities of faith. At least that's where it starts for Nicodemus. Jesus takes it real pretty quick and points out to Nicodemus that he's too caught up in the law, in the structures, in the way things are, that he needs to find a new life of freedom in spirit and light. He uses these metaphors throughout it of spirit and water, water and light, mixes these into this beautiful conversation. And it's interesting because that conversation flows into the text we have today. Translating ancient Greek isn't easy. So sometimes with a lack of punctuation, they don't know exactly what's Jesus and what's a narrator. And we get that today as this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus goes back and forth, back and forth. And before you know it, all of a sudden we have this narrator voice talking that may be Jesus or maybe not. Jesus is critical of Nicodemus. The rules, the laws, the lack of spirituality, the lack of mystery, the lack of mystery. Today's conversation invites us to wonder where we fit into the conversation. Actually, it starts out with one of the more common passages we hear quoted. For God so loved the world, God sent God's own Son, that the world might be saved. God sends Jesus to save the world, not to condemn it, although Right afterwards, John goes on to say that anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus is already condemned. It's a difficult passage. It's a difficult flow. It starts with, for God so loved the world that God sent Jesus to all of us to save the world. Not to condemn it, but if you don't believe, you're condemned. Cognitive dissonance. Are you with me? Cognitive dissonance. 
Now, there's a few things we can wrestle with here. One is, we don't know what was the original writing, what was the voice of Jesus, what's the voice of John, and what's a really cranky scribe in the ancient church that projected their arguments with the Roman Empire into the text. It gets complicated. But if we just take the scripture the way we receive it today, if we take it with the evident contradiction, I came not to condemn but to save, but then you're all going to hell, then we have to wrestle with what this means. John goes on to sound like Jesus is condemning a world, including those who came before Jesus who couldn't have known about him, including those who have fallen short, who have fallen short of Jesus' teachings, even those who might have followed the teachings of Jesus in years to come but didn't believe in Jesus, those who would have loved neighbor as themselves but didn't know God. So which is it? Which is it? Did Jesus come to save the world and not condemn? Or did Jesus come to be the dividing line for us to condemn each other and divide Christians against one another? Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. They say that with cognitive dissonance, you have three ways to resolve the conflict. Three ways to get around the tension. The first is to simply change our behaviors. Change what we see based on evidence, right? So if smoking causes cancer, you smoke a pack a day, you go to the doctor with a bad cough, and they say if you don't stop smoking, you're gonna die, you can choose to, get this, stop smoking. It solves the problem. If you've been in a relationship and they always cheat on you, and you say, if I love them more this time, one more time, and then they cheat on you again, you cannot be surprised. Cognitive dissonance can be unraveled by choosing to change our behavior, to not take that person back another time, to stop smoking, to maybe believe something different. The second option is to minimize the importance of the contradiction to minimize the importance, to say, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's a minor contradiction that doesn't make a big difference in my life. It's not a huge deal, so I'll just dismiss it. And then the cognitive dissonance leaves our mind and we can worry about other things like whether or not somebody will get a rose this week on The Bachelor. Those are the first two options. Change our beliefs or let go of one. And let's be honest, many people have just left the church taking this option number one, right? I see the cognitive dissonance, it doesn't make sense. I see the church say this and then be hypocritical on this, I'm out. That's the easy solution, right? Done. We can minimize the importance, and in the church we see people use expressions like, well, it's a mystery, I don't understand it, it's okay. Well, you just have to have enough faith, if you just believe in God enough, none of the contradictions matter. It's just minimizing the issue that's before you. The third option with cognitive dissonance, the third option is seeking other authorities to help reconcile the issue. Uh-oh, this one's work. Seeking other authorities, using our brains, diving in, studying, using the scholarship before us, putting the scripture in context with others, talking with other people. Now come on, that requires Bible study. That requires some intentionality. That requires me to put my head and my heart together. Why can't you just give me a pamphlet, Pastor, that tells me what to do? If we're talking about eternal issues, if we're talking about issues of eternity and our spiritual soul, isn't it worth researching just a little bit? Isn't it worth putting just a little bit of effort in to reconcile these things? We'll go really deep into a Google rabbit hole to find out which sushi restaurant has the freshest California roll. But we won't seek understanding to our spiritual questions. The third option with cognitive dissonance is to find more information. And so that's the direction we're going today. Because the sermon hasn't been too long so far and I've got you for a few more minutes. Remember, John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John is a theological writer, not a chronological storyteller. He doesn't start out with a Christmas story like everybody else. He starts out with this giant metaphysical metaphor that's hard for our brains to wrap around, but it suggests that God becomes 
real and present in the person of Jesus. That God is incarnated into the world in the presence of Jesus in a way that we might not be able to put words to. That's a bigger concept than John's got the language for. But this word, this understanding, this will of God, the spirit of God comes and dwells among us relationally. This is just two chapters earlier. John 3, God's manifestation in the world is clarified to be not one sent to condemn. It's not meant to be a condemnation that God is present, but to save, to connect, to be present. John 3 goes on to say that those who do not believe in Jesus are condemned. They choose darkness over light. Now, believe is a curious word. Those who do not believe are condemned. The word believe has a clear meaning in our society today, or at least we act like it does. We act like some things are more concrete than they really are. But we hear people say all the time, I believe in Christmas magic. Which of the cartoons are they believing in? Because we know many of them are children's stories, right? Am I saying this cryptically enough? Yvonne, am I saying it cryptically enough? <laughs> I don't want to ruin anybody's story at Christmas, but there's parts we believe in and parts we believe in what's behind it, right? We believe in the hope of it, the goodwill of it, the intent of it, regardless of how many times the elf has been moved around the shelf for the glory of capitalism. We believe in our friends. We believe in our loved ones, no matter how many times they left us without a ride, no matter how many times they were late, no matter how many times they didn't listen to us when we were needed. We still believe in our friends. We believe in our loved ones. Even when we watch them make horrible decisions, we believe in them. What is it exactly? Which part of them are we believing in? We believe in some things, but that doesn't mean we swallow them whole. We can believe in things with some room for the gray area, for some nuance, and we get that, right? Yet when we start talking about believing in Jesus, we go to the concrete, we go to the tactile, we go to an extreme that we don't go to in other places. Believing in aliens, does not mean you were abducted as a child or you're going to go storm Area 51 with the rest of the crazies this month. Believing in America does not mean you can't respect somebody who protests. Believing in America does not lead, have to lead us to an irrational patriotism that gets woven into faith. Believing in a relationship doesn't mean that relationship won't take work, right? Well, my partner and I really believed in each other. Did you go to counseling? No, but we really believed in each other. Believing in a team doesn't mean you can't appreciate the good that your opponent does. Unless in my case, it's New Year's Day and Kentucky plays Louisville, and then they're just evil. But other than that, believing. Believing has a broader meaning than we would like to believe, right? Marcus Borg, a well-known Bible scholar, points out that the word believe has also evolved. It has a broader meaning now, but its meaning in antiquity, in ancient times, was probably more akin to be loving. Be loving. When you hear an idea that you really like, can you imagine yourself go, I can believe in that. Amen. I get where they're coming from. I can vibe with that. I could be love that idea. I be love a lot of things that I hear in other religious traditions. They're not mine, but I beloved them. I appreciate them. I beloved the Jewish tradition of having the Shema in a box by the door that every time you come in and out from your doorpost, you're reminded of the very presence of God with us at all times and places. I beloved that idea. I'm not Jewish. I love the idea of stopping for prayer five times a day, centering ourselves regardless of what else happens. I'm not Muslim, but I do love that concept. I believe it can be life-changing. We can beloved something. We have to be clear about what we mean 
when we use words, and especially in this context, believe. We can beloved something, connect with it relationally, like healthy patriotism, like supporting our favorite team, like believing or beloving in our children, even when they do something dumb. We can continue to beloved and be in relationship. Then we have to look at the context of the scripture we read today. Not only do we have the believe, beloved, curiosity, we have to look at the context. John's gospel in general is problematic. It's not that John's a bad writer, he's a beautiful writer, but he has no business with timelines, he doesn't care. The order things happened in are different than the other gospels because he's creating this cyclical story that spirals us closer to Jerusalem and the crucifixion as he teaches who Jesus is in his understanding in this tradition of the ancient church. There's no timelines. John's not a big fan of this thing we call accuracy. He's focused more on the metaphor than the tool that the metaphor is delivered through. He's not a big fan of consistency. The inconsistencies don't matter to him. It's do you get enough of my metaphors to grasp who I'm telling you Jesus is? What John is all about is teaching about Jesus and the very real presence of God with us. The very real presence of God with us. In chapter 3, John wants us to know, he wants us to know that people have heard about Jesus. And if we've heard about Jesus, if we're ones who've received the story, and we cannot beloved the work of Jesus, if we can't beloved it, if we can hear Jesus' ministry, the stories he told, and we can't beloved it, if we can see Jesus healing people, caring for people, lifting up those who've been put down, if we can hear a message of love and grace and not be love it, we are already coming from a really dark place. That's on us, not God. If we can see what Jesus did and not be love it, we have a darkness in us that's an issue. We've got some things to work through. John is teaching about God in metaphors of light and darkness. Context of Pharisees who don't want to let go of power, but want to be closer to God. In the context of leaders who put structures over people. John is seeing this divide, and he's trying to make sure they know there's a right and a wrong side to the divide they've created. If they can see what Jesus is doing and not be love it, then they are so far down the darkness that they are condemned. They are separated. They have separated themselves from God, and they cannot seem to overcome that darkness, to see what is right in front of them. John is saying, listen to Jesus, and if you can't affirm or appreciate him, if you can't hear the echoes of the prophets in what Jesus is saying, if you can't see the movement of God's spirit in what Jesus is doing, if you can't understand a message of love, if you can't be loved one who embodies love and grace, <laughs> it sucks to be you. If you can't value love, you're in a tough spot. I'm sad for you. I'm sorry that's true for you, he might have said. In the beginning, God created people in God's own image and called them good. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, in the beginning, first page of the Bible, God created people, male and female, same time, called it all good. In the beginning, God has been soft on crime. Threatening like a parent coming down there or turning this car around while always giving another second chance. Don't believe me? Read the second and third pages of the Bible. From the beginning, Jesus affirmed those that others judged. Jesus affirmed those that others judged, and he loved those who judged and failed him. Can we, can we believe God is a God of love and so easily condemns people to hell. Can we believe that? Or do we have enough information? Do we have enough evidence to trust that those who live in the light will know God's love? That regardless of our religion, regardless of what generation we've lived our story, regardless of what mistakes we've made, that those who can be love the light are blessed by the light. 
Do we have enough information? Do we have enough evidence to trust that those that live in darkness, those that live in darkness are exactly the people that God calls us to love? Not condemn, not to judge, to love. Those are exactly the people that God sends us to serve. Those are exactly people like you and me with doubts, with mistakes, with times our darkness outshines our light, times that we feed the dark wolf instead of the good one, times when we wish we could go back and do it over. Do we have enough information to be love the message of Jesus? When we balance this scripture with all the times that Jesus welcomed a foreigner, when we balance the scripture with all the times that God used the villain in the story to save God's people, when we balance this scripture with all the times that God works through the outsider in the story, all the times that the scriptures give us information about beloving, with all the evidence we have about God, can we just beloved the message? Can we just be love God's people and trust that condemnation is our concern, not God's? That judgment is our obsession, not God's? Trust that we are all beloved of God and God created and still beloves us in the world. Amen.